you stay in good conversation, you got to tune in to Coffee and Conversation with Colette. That's me. Thursday mornings from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. on the only station, WHBR TV 33. See you soon. to you. You're officially tuned into Coffee and Conversation with Colette and I am Colette. You all know I do my curtsy because I'm up in the building here on WHVR TV 33 with you or Comcast or Roku or streaming live. However you got here, thank you so much because I know you're excited about the conversation that we're going to have today. Let me give you the call-in numbers, 313-868-0342 or 313-868-0351 or 313-868-4336. That's how you can call in and be a part of the conversation. As always, I let you know, because it is our mantra here, to educate, enlighten, and empower. There's more than one way to have a conversation. And so at the end of this conversation, I promise you, you will walk away with several aha moments Several moments in which throughout the day you're going to reflect on our conversation. It's going to make you say, hmm, I just love that. I love when thoughts come together, the series of events come together throughout the week that prepare us to have the conversation that we're going to have today. Before I begin, I just want to say a belated happy birthday to an amazing woman, Helen Shelton. She's a... Uh, She's everything. She's a partner with Finn Partners out of New York. They have offices all over this world, and she's my friend. So it is a pleasure for me to wish her a belated happy birthday. And to my cousin son is what I call him, LR3. You are traveling, and you are preparing to have a tournament, a baseball tournament uh, in Florida. And so all the best to you. And then, of course, I have to say to his amazing sister, Jasmine, we actually had a little bit of this conversation on the phone. So it's awesome when you can engage a young person, a teen, and get their perspective. And so they let you know that they're thinking. They're thinking. And so that's what I want us to do today. I want us to think. Now, everyone, a lot of conversations have been had this week. You all know that we are attempting to do something in government that has never been done before. I don't know if you even believe that it is worthwhile or if you've even thought about the ramifications of the actions. And I'm not suggesting local. I'm talking about from a national perspective, actually even an international perspective, the ramifications of the actions. You all know that President Donald Trump has keep kept pushing for his band. He's pushing and trying and pushing and trying. Well, as of late, there has been a partial approval for a travel ban. So it's gone through. A little bit has gone through. And so now there are these seven countries in which the band is going to impact. And overall, it is that you just have to have a justifiable reason to be able to come into the states, whether you are a student who's approval for a university, you're an individual coming here to work, Actually, I just really think that that's funny because anyone, if you have a malicious intent, you could be a student coming here for the university and have malicious intent. What does that mean? You could be someone coming here for a job in America and have malicious intent. So we are all under the guise that it has to look a certain way to be a certain way in what we think is going to give an outcome that's going to be devastating. So you have to look like a terrorist whatever that means, and then you won't have an entree into the United States. I mean, come on, stop. And in conversating with our team here this morning, I just thought about it. I should have entitled this show, Who's the Real Terrorist? And maybe we'll get to that in the midst of it. But our topic for today is, is there attack on what? Islam. A lot of things have been happening, and in the midst of everything that we say we are in our country, in America, it just, it's just as blatant as ever that we are just as racist as ever, that we are just as judgmental as ever, as that we are just as, just everything that is against who we say that we are to this world. And I think that it's very indicative of what we're seeing happening now with Muslims in America. And I know a lot of you are going to say, well, Colette, 
I believe that what is happening with them is no different than what has happened with blacks coming out of slavery. And I want you to stay there. That's where I want you to go. Because I had to ask myself, and I'm asking you, is the issue with Muslims and Islam real? So we keep talking about, oh, these radical individuals and their beliefs and they fight for what they believe in and they blow up things for what they believe in and they capture people and they oppress people and they kill people for what they believe in and then we attach it to their religion and say that it's because they are Muslims and following Islam that they do these things. And so I really wanted us to think about today the truths in that. A, is it not hypocritical of the United States to then call themselves, call ourselves oppressing a group of individuals and stereotyping a group of individuals and classifying a group of individuals based on what they believe and then how it has its impact on us. And the reason why I pause, I made a deliberate pause because I believe and I equate that to slavery. So those who came and colonized these Americas used religion, used their belief, used the Bible to control and enslave the original people who were here and the individuals that they brought over from other countries to enslave. And so I need to understand what the difference is. And so if that is then the case, because there were several millions who died for what they believe in here, in America, on the way to America, for something that was a cause not of our own being brought here to do the work and the bidding for someone else because of their greed. And in their goal to establish this new great land and country that was based off of oppression. But now today, we are talking about oppressing a group of people because of their religious beliefs, because we believe that those religious beliefs then cause them to act erratic and to kill people and to do bombings. But is that any different than what we have done, meaning what America has done to black and brown people throughout our history? Is it any different than what America is doing with legislation and belief today for us, the people who are citizens today? Is it still the relevancy of the oppression through religion today? Uh. I want you all to think about that. And in the midst of all of that, if that is the truth, if it is about religion because we don't understand it, meaning America doesn't understand Islam, then why do we always have to kill something, destroy something, assassinate the validity of something because we as Americans don't understand it? I just, I need to understand that. And so I wanted us to kind of have that conversation this morning. I wanted you to think about it. Because in the midst of everything, and we're going to have a clip when the clip comes up, and it's about eight minutes, but it's a focus group. It's a focus group about um, Muslims in America, such a diverse group of individuals. So the truth is, maybe you wonder what America is going to do with Muslims. Do you think that America is going to then try to put in great conversation and morning to you, Maria, my sister cousin, in our conversation, she suggested, well, maybe America is going to try to put them in concentration camps, put them, round them up and put them somewhere. Because we're creating that energy. We're creating that separatism. We're creating that division. We're creating that type of anxiety. America is creating the same fear that it created for slaves, for black people in America who had done the service of building America. And then upon being granted freedom, then now we're afraid of you. We're fearful of you. We're going to kill you. We're going to assassinate your character. We're going to tell you how you should look, what you should think, what you should believe. We're going to give you the Bible to use that as your by and by. I'm asking us today, and maybe there are a lot of different, because, and I know there are a lot of different areas that you can attack this thing, this conversation today, because it's going to make you think of a lot of different areas. Because if then that's the case, you need to ask yourself, I had to ask myself, why then do I prescribe to Christianity as was presented to us through the Bible? That was their Bible. And so that was one of the conversations yesterday that in talking to my sister cousin Maria, and she said, well, no, I don't believe that it was the Bible. It was the people that used the Bible. And so her daughter, Jasmine, the 16 year old said, well, no, it was the Bible, mom. And I said, nice. I, I love that she's thinking. And so my position is it's both. So you use a tool 
in which you say you believe, but none of your actions show your belief in that Bible as you oppress and kill and assassinate individuals from the onset of slavery all the way up until 2017. It is still happening right now. The value of black and brown and tan people in this country is nothing still. The value of our lives is nothing. Still, still, let me just say still. So that was okay then. And so now we're looking at a group of people and we're creating these, this band. And so much so that a lot of Muslims have created, have you heard of a no-go zone? So in these United States of America, they've identified areas in which they share amongst each other that we don't need to go into that area because it won't be safe for us. And so we're talking about an America that it says it's freedom for all, justice for all, expression, freedom, expression, religion, expression, for all, you can worship the way you want. You can practice the way you want. You can live the way you want in these United States of America, but we are the first ones now assassinating a group of people because of their religion. And so I'm asking America today, is that the truth? Is that really what the, our issue is? Or is there something in these seven locations in Iran and Iraq and in Libya, and I can give you the seven countries, if it is something there that we want? So if it's something that we want, then we create the rhetoric, we create the, the imagery, we create the conversation to make everyone say that that is bad. Our own President Trump has said they don't like us. How do we know that they don't like us? And if they don't like us, is it justifiable? I mean, let's look at it this way. That's like us looking at a situation and saying, okay, well, I don't like the way that you're doing this. I don't like the way you're persecuting people. I don't like the way that you are running your household. And then we jump over in the household and say, okay, well, you should do it this way. You know what? I might be kind of upset too. I might say, you know what? Mind your business. It's none of your concern. Our issues are our issues over here. Why then do you say you need to come over here and butt your nose in our business for the sake of global unity and what you think is justice for some, which will be uh, up cup, uh, upcoming, some, some growth for you as America coming over here? And for those who didn't want to live that way and for those who came to America, that was a choice. But you still have individuals who want that lifestyle, that way of life, that culture. But here we go telling somebody, oh, it's wrong. And then it's wrong, why? Because we attached it to their religion. So then we say it's Islam, okay? So are we saying then that Christianity was the issue for the colonizers? So that, that's, is that the comparative? So if it's so bad, then that's what Christianity did to the colonizers. And then they, of course, oppressed the people who then established and had built America before they got here. Let me give you a quote, and all the lines are lit, and I see you all, so I appreciate that. Our quote for today, I want you to think about it, and it is coming from our own Malcolm X, which states, quote, America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. So let me give it to you one again because I want you to think about this. America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. And that was quoted from our own Malcolm X. And so when you understand, and the clip is going to really give a justification for it, that individuals who study Islam are a diverse group. You don't ever know who you're going to, not everyone wears the hijab. And I'm going to give you an international perspective. France has banned the hijab. So if young girls are going to school, when before you enter into that school day, your school day, to start your day, you have to remove your hijab. That's a part of them. That's their culture. That's how they display their religion. They have to remove their hijab in the class, in that whole school day. And then when they exit, then they can put it on. But then the adults now, the women, there has been a fine, a minimum of $150, that if you are caught wearing your hijab in public, you will be fined. What does that say to you? 
So if we now are saying that because you choose to practice your religion in an outward way with an, a piece of an attire, then we're so offended by it that we're going to create laws that oppress you. And so there was a gentleman who's a wealthy businessman out of France, and he actually is uh, Muslim. And he says that he supports the women's right to freedom, and he pays the fines. However, he did quote that, I believe that this doesn't allow us to assimilate best into this society. Do you have a problem with that? Why do we have to assimilate? Why are we always having to make things justifiable and convenient and comfortable for the group that is oppressing us? Have you found that in America? We're always having to explain why it is, why it is that way. Why do you feel the way you do? I have to make you feel comfortable in your oppression of me. Let me give you another example that is happening right now in France again. The burkini is, was banned, let me say that. Now the burkini is a full body suit that Muslim women can wear when they go to the beach. So they're still covered up, but it's in a swimwear type of look. Do you know that was banned? Because the conversation was that it made others on the beach feel uncomfortable. So I'm sorry, you had a woman here that was bathing, sunbathing topless, and she didn't have anything on. You had another woman that had a bathing, a scantily clad bathing suit on. And then you have a woman in a full burkini, and you say you're offended by the woman who's covered up. <laughs> Based on what I'm saying. And so then when it was so much protest and that ban was lifted, I, I saw a clip, a young lady went on to go to the beach and she was just ostracized. Like from the time she got there, got in the water, people stopped, they gawked, they started arguing, why is she here? Why is she wearing that? And so much so then that she left. And I'm just wondering, is that who we say we are? And so if we're going to have situations where we're uncomfortable with the hijab, if we're uncomfortable with the burkini, should we be uncomfortable with the cross? You know, a lot of us wear the crosses around our neck. So that's an outward display. So then are we going to ban the crosses that we wear? I'm asking, are we going to ban the Bibles that a lot of us keep in our hands as we walk and travel day to day? Are we talking about a fair society, a just society? So really, who is the real terrorist? Has America now turned on a group of individuals that are here and said, okay, now we're going to terrorize you? What do you think? I'm going to go to the clip. Cause I see you all. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to go to the clip. I want you all to see that, and then I want us to engage, okay? I think that'll be a great way to start our conversation this morning. Muslims entering the U.S., the topic has been widely debated on and off the campaign trail. Republican strategist and CBS News contributor Frank Luntz led a focus group of 16 Muslim Americans last night to get their take. How does it feel that your faith is at the core of one of the most disruptive, divisive political conversations in a long, long time? How does that make you feel? I feel optimistic because this gives me a chance and us a chance to tell us, to tell you guys who we really are. We're in the spotlight, we're in the media, and we haven't had this type of attention before. And we can focus on the negative or we can be positive and we can be inspiring and we can be hopeful. Frank, I think it's an opportunity for us to share a narrative. American Muslims come from 77 different countries, speak over 100 different uh, languages and dialects. We're lumped together a lot in the media, and largely the narrative is something of ISIS or someone else. That's not our religion. That's not our narrative. And I think it's time for us to take that back. I also think that it's important not to ignore the fact that all this painful conversation is not necessarily positive, even though it is an opportunity. Um, oftentimes there are manifestations of violence of this rhetoric. Now, you said it's painful. Yeah. How is it painful? Because it's, this is... My faith is representative of part of who I am, um, and for me to see that it has been so demonized is painful, and it's scary. I actually did a call out to Muslim parents across the country to not watch the Republican debate in front of their children, mm -hmm. because I knew that, that uh, subjecting our children to hear the hateful um, stereotyping and the lumping of Muslims with terrorism in front of our children is actually something that is psychologically impacts them. So that's how deep this is for us. But don't you want the kids to know the challenges that they face? 
I you don't want my children to be subjected to uh, racism or the vilification of their faith. I will explain to my kids in my own way, in the way that I can speak to them, and I will not allow Donald Trump to tell my kids um, how they should feel about being Muslim. Right. How <laughs> many of you are physically afraid oh, yeah. because of you're physically afraid? After 9-11, I was in fifth grade, and I was actually slapped by another student at school for being Muslim. So I, like, as a child growing up post 9-11, I was physically attacked. That was a part of my childhood, and it's getting worse. How many of you have been physically attacked? Tell me what happened. I, when I was 16 years old, I was attacked in New York City as I was walking down the street. A man attempted to remove, remove my headscarf, and I was able to escape. As a result of that, I actually founded an organization to teach Muslim women self-defense. Mm -hmm. In the past six years, this past three months have been the heaviest time for us. But do you understand why people are afraid? I, I absolutely understand to a certain degree why people are afraid. We can't hide behind the fact that Americans right now, non-Muslim Americans, do feel afraid. And why do they feel afraid? They feel afraid because of what's happening abroad and because of their safety is, is at an issue here in America. But they also feel afraid for a deeper reason. They just don't understand. And then when they see a woman wearing a hijab or a man wearing a, a topi uh, uh, after he's prayed, they become afraid. Not because of the fact that their safety is concerned, because somebody looks different. We're not chanting death to America. Okay, we don't have bombs in our hands, okay? We're just being ourselves. And this is a narrative that's missing right now. The point here is about the issues. And I am so sick for begging love and begging attention. Like, oh, look, I'm a Muslim, I'm a doctor, I'm a Muslim, I'm a journalist. No, we're a Muslim Americans. I'm proud to be a Muslim. I'm proud to be an American. And no one's going to take that away from me, regardless. So I've got to uh, ask you guys, how did you feel when you first learned that the murderer in San Bernardino held your faith? I mean, every time, any, but every Frank, time that there's some kind of an attack in this country, every time that there's any kind of a crime, I'm literally praying, and I'm sure that everyone else here literally praying that it's not a Muslim. Before, yeah, before any facts start going through, we're literally praying that it's not a Muslim. And when it is, I know exactly what's going to happen. The people that committed those heinous crimes, they were not members of my faith. I want that to be very clear. I am not in the business of saying who's Muslim and who's not Muslim. If yeah. those people want to yeah. call themselves Muslims, then that they can call themselves Muslims. People do not know anything about Muslims. There's a Pew poll that says more than 60% of Americans have never even met a Muslim. So how do you expect the media to portray it? We don't even have someone in the media to speak for us. I mean, it's just laziness. It's like they don't want to blame a single person for something. They want to make a blanket statement over a whole group of people. So then just... what should we do about what happened in Paris? There was, not a, talk. there was not a single individual. Engage us. Engage us. It's, I mean, it's, it's literally us. that easy. And it's also not the it's most... The, the burden of responsibility shouldn't be on us, though. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Not exactly. the most why, why are you asking us this question, and why not ask white America the question? That is where the question belongs. Who committed the crimes not in us. Paris? Not us. Not us. Not us. So why do we have to speak for them? In America, what we're largely dealing with when we see acts of terrorism, they are specifically coming from disenfranchised folks who are outliers in the Muslim community. There is a problem. There's been too many American Muslims that have uh, committed violence. And their interpretation is such that this is in the name of religion. So I don't want to be, I don't think we can um, you know, run away from that. There's been too many of these incidents. Are you Muslim first or American first? I am an American Muslim. I can be both at the same time. I don't choose one over the other. I am an American Muslim. I am both simultaneously. We will say today that Islam does not equal terrorism. But when you go outside, the Trumps of the world will believe that. They need demonstrative proof, which they will never get because folks that are Muslim are committing these violent acts. I think the American people are capable of understanding that Muslims look, look are terrorists. The... And I think something that's been missing from the media conversation, most ISIS recruits, most terrorist recruits actually don't know much about their religion before they get recruited. Well, that's usually thing that's usually they're, they're very uneducated, and then they meet one radical cleric, and he defines the religion for them. You want to combat terrorism? You need Muslims. So keep pushing us out of the picture, and let's see if you can combat terrorism without our community. That's what's happening right now. Frank, as an American and a Muslim, we're your last line of defense. And that's what we'd really like to be addressed as, a line of defense that we can draw the line in the stand and say, this is where we are, this is where we push back on terrorism. ISIS has an ideology that's not Islam. 
in order for us to stop this, we need to get away from rhinos like Donald Trump, and we need to start looking at how we solve these problems together as Americans. You know, there are so many other issues besides our religion. Mm -hmm. So I am very passionate about how do we build coalitions with people who have suffered like us, but mm -hmm. let's all come together. You know, this is not a Muslim only issue. You know, I'm an American, we are Americans here. You yep. know, and we, we have so many facets to our identity. Yep. We cannot so. be characterized in this neat little box. I think even though obviously this focus group stems from the anti-Islamic bigotry that has been happening, I also think it's very important that Muslim Americans are invited to conversations that are not only about oh, anti-Islamic bigotry and counter-violent extremism, right? So if you're having a focus group about public health, invite a Muslim American. Or economic justice, invite a Muslim American. That's what we need, sure. diversity and culture. I think the one conversation is not really being had is what is at the root of Islamophobia today. It's not just rhetoric, it's policies. And as I keep saying policies, policies, and we need to talk about that. What is the government doing to make a change? What has the government done that enable this kind of bigotry? Repeating that this is un-American, that it's un-American to be uh, hateful towards a group of people is historically inaccurate, as difficult as that is for me to say, because I want to say that this is un-American. This is not what our values are. We have, we have targeted, we have discriminated against, we have um, um, grouped and generalized in and prejudiced. Uh, we've had internment camps of exactly. groups before. This, this, is a, this, is a, this is an ugly part of our history and hopefully not a part of our future. Everyone, you got it. I thought it was an amazing clip. I appreciate it. I appreciate the round table and the moderator. And, you know, Frank Oates, he kind of put it out there and I, I love the pushback. I love that, why are you asking us? We're being oppressed. Why are you asking us how to make it comfortable for you? And I love that the conversation was presented that we have to change the narrative. Who is consistently telling our story? And then last, my takeaway from that is then you want to look and identify and hold a group of people accountable for who is doing the atrocities, but isn't that what America has consistently done to black and brown people? I'm asking. So that is the wrap up for the intro for the conversation today. I'm going to go to the lines. I appreciate your patience. A great morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Great interview. Great interview. Great point. Nice. Uh, similarity. Uh, what they're going through, so have other groups, uh, <clears throat> Indians and uh, Negroes, blacks, or whatever we want to call ourselves since we allow them to give us our title. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the history of your uh, colonizers uh, continue to repeat itself as predators. Mm -hmm. They uh, criminalize. The criminals are criminalizing, demonizing, and ostracizing, and the list goes on. So history, as we see, repeats itself, only now they're attacking a different group. Yes. Um, they continue to be the big fish, uh, put themselves in the position to be the big fish to eat up everybody else. Mm -hmm. They are the cause of the racist policies, mm -hmm. the uh, state military uh, occupied military style policing. Uh, I would like to see these white people that say they don't believe or they don't see to color themselves dark brown or black and to put on the Muslim attire and drive while looking Muslim and looking black and feel the terror and the terrorism that uh, we go through when we're trying to have the freedom to travel. Yes. And let's see how they feel and think then when they see their sons and daughters being subjugated and their family subject to this type of uh, terrorism. Because yes. that's all it is, um, uh, terror in America. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And I think we talked about it on this show. Remember the Green Book? It was a Green Book that we had had established some years ago. So when black folk was riding through the country, you would know where not to go, where were there safe areas where you wouldn't be accosted. So we've gone through the same thing now. Yeah, well, sundown, they were called sundown cities. Yep. Yes. Yes. And so now you just, it isn't it amazing that now we are on the outside looking at that oppression. Now, mind you, we're still oppressed, but now we're looking uh, at yeah. it from a different angle to a different group of people. That's right. Ah. Oh. So the cancer is spreading. Yeah, it's spreading. And you know what? And I want to know 
how do when you see someone and that's the beauty of what he said about when you are a muslim you're practicing or you're studying islam you don't know not everyone wears the hijab but i wonder when you see someone who is in the attire do you speak to them everybody are you comfortable or is there still just a separation and you say, well, Kaleida, it doesn't really matter because then I don't speak to people that look like me or I just don't go around speaking to people and does it make a difference? I mean, I just want us to think about those things because I believe that there are more similarities than there are differences. Of course there are. Okay. Of course you're right. Okay. Okay. Love your show. Love your show. Love your feedback. It's our show, and I love your feedback. Thank you. And everyone, You're did you welcome. all know, have an amazing day. And if we just want to talk about it and we want to make it right at home, I mean, Hamtramck is one of the largest cities for Muslims in this country. Hamtramck, that's right, it's a border to Detroit. Hamtramck. And you all know that Hamtramck originally the Polish immigrants who came in, and now there was a clip, and I could bring that up, Muslims are the majority in Hamtramck. Majority city council now are Muslims. And so we have that, that dynamic right here at home. And do we see the differences here? Does it resonate differently with us? I want to know what you think. Thanks for your patience. Great morning to you. How are you doing today? Great. How are you? All right. First, I want to do a shout out to TV33. Okay. Uh, Comcast. Channel 91. Yes. Mr. R.J. Watkins. Yes. All other TV show hosts, uh, uh, Western PJD Hill. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me give a little shout out to Son of Man. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Colette, for bringing this uh, subject matter attention to everybody in the uh, listening world. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to say one tool of success mm -hmm. before I make a comment okay. about your show. Okay. Because it's relative to your show. Okay. The tool of success I like to mention is kinship and fellowship should always be practiced by people of common faith. I'm okay, so wait. So let me just say that again. Everyone, I want you all to get this. Kinship and fellowship should always be practiced by people of a common faith? Correct. Okay. Now, by me saying that, all right. that's the show right there. Okay. Meaning, we, in, in 1860, this country had laws made laws against people based on race. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. So since we live in a country that over 150 years ago made law against people based on race, yes. there has always been a protectivism that this country has empowered and is willing to kill people mm -hmm. for that protectivism. Okay. That's the Civil War. Okay. That's World War I. That's World War II. Okay. So with that being said, going back to that tool of success, mm -hmm. these people in this country profess to be of a certain religion, profess to be of a certain mindset, mm -hmm. and this country has a history of protectionism, whereas if you go against that, yes. they will kill you. Yes. <laughs> you people don't, I mean, yes. you, you know, when you when when you look at the media right now, you look at the movies, you look at the TV shows, mm -hmm. you're still seeing a person that looks much 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 lighter than me, yes, with a gun, killing people and having an excuse. Meaning, if you on the side of him, he ain't shooting you. You're supposed to be congratulating him. But if he killed your family member, right. somebody that you love, yeah. it doesn't matter the reason. Why he got killed? Right. You're supposed to suck it up. That's how this country is. Man. So let's go back to the, the movie, uh, the little show, okay. the little uh, episode that you saw for CBS. Yes. You saw a white guy surrounded by different people who say they were Muslim. Mm -hmm. The questions that he asked, they had to justify. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if that same show was over Qatar, over Saudi Arabia. Yes. It wouldn't have been a white man. It would have been somebody else. Yes. But yes. that that was still a mass media here. So yes. it still comes down to who is the ideology that's running things. Yes. Yes. Okay? Yes. So right now if you Muslim, most people think that if you Arab, you Muslim. Right. Here in the city of Detroit, there is a thing called Kabdin, which are Christian Arabs. Mm -hmm. Now if you go back to 
the last war our country was in, in North Iraq is the area that was inhabited by Christian Arabs. Mm -hmm. That was the first area that was devastated. Okay. City of Detroit is inhabited with Chaldeans. Yes. Okay. If you remember when they first liberated Iraq, it was Iraqis who were celebrating in Dearborn. Mm -hmm. They weren't the Muslims. They were the Christians because they were the first ones that was dealing with atrocities. Yeah. Okay. But let's go back to the history of why there's so many people that believe this. We've all heard the term the Caucasus. Yes. But the Caucasus Mountain is in Northeast Asia. Yeah. So the whole area that we're talking about is where Caucasians originated from. Okay. Yeah. So when you go back into the history of that, right, there's a new found understanding about Babylon, about Jesus, mm -hmm. about Israel, mm -hmm. about Palestine, mm -hmm. and the whole area. Mm -hmm. It's not funny that Russia and the United States are forming together to fight with or against Syria in the same world. Yeah. That's no accident. Great point. So Absolutely. to go back to what you said, there's a misconception about Arabs being Muslims. Yes. Whereas Muslim is a religion. We're in a Christian society. Yes. It's through our government. Yes. It's through our socialization. Yes. It's through our politics. Yes. You see Christianity all through that. So if you're not talking Christianity in this country, yes. you're going to run into a problem. Yeah. Great show, dear. No, oh, I appreciate you so much, part of the National Hip Hop. I'm pretty pleasure. sure a couple of people should make a couple of comments about what I said. Sure. But thank you for bringing. <laughs> Colorblind mindset to the city of Detroit. I appreciate you. My card there. Absolutely, I appreciate it. I mean, everyone, if you haven't got it by now, I hope you do. I just want us to look at things. Remember, it's all about who shapes our narrative. And we keep talking about that. We talk about from week to week, all the different examples about why we are suffering the way that we are, why we don't have the things that we think we need, why we're fighting so hard to say that one person's position is right over the other person's position. It's all about who shapes the narrative. And so I'm asking us today, what does that really look like for us? Have we thought about it? Because we can use this model as a learning tool. Because it is happening to all of us in this great place that we live in called America. And as 8 Mile said, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, the, it's supposed to be the kinship for individuals. So I'm supposed to be able to identify that in you. So I have no problems if I go and I see someone who has the hijab on and I can greet you in the words, assalamu alaikum. Not a problem. It, it's not a problem. Just like if I saw, I told you I saw the people in Ferndale and they had on the their symbols of their church and prayer, and then they wouldn't even speak. I'm just saying there's a commonality that we need to have amongst each other if we are in the human race and then work to realistically identify why we are having the conversations that we're having and how it impacts us. But again, I want to know what you have to think. Thanks for your patience. Great morning to you. Are you there? Good morning, Qu good morning Queen. Oh, good morning, King. Queen. Yes. Excellent uh, subject. Thank you, Queen. Being 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 a being a Muslim, practicing Islam. Yes. You know, up under the teaching of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. And uh, Minister Farrakhan, uh, Queen. Uh, Islam is a religion of peace, first of all. Right. And uh, Queen, uh, as the previous callers of all said, and and we have to, and and this is where it. Take study, and when you study the history of the European and how the Europeans emptied the prisons and sent them on ships to the, what they call the Americas and whatnot, yes, and how they wiped out the indigenous people that were here, black Indians that were here, yes, how they wiped them out everywhere they went, they have shed blood, yes. In the Quran, it speaks about the blood shedder. In other words, it speaks about a particular people that would be given power, and they will be bloodshed, meaning they will cause bloodshed all over the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And they have they have done this. Yeah. And, and so, Queen, when it comes to Islam, the average person don't know that the average president of this country practiced Islam in secrecy. Huh. When you become a 33rd degree Mason Shriner in good standings, you put down the cross and you pick up the crescent and you become a Muslim son. Mm -hmm. That George Washington was one of the first 
Masonic uh, president. Okay. This is why they call him the first president, but he was the first Masonic. He was a Muslim son. He practiced Islam in secrecy. And so we have to study history. Okay, yeah. uh, Sister Queen, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Arab Spring okay. that was uh, orchestrated over 20 years ago. Okay. And that's where the, the CIA, the American government, plotted to overthrow, I think it was six Arab countries. Okay. That was to set the leadership down and place puppet regimes in there. Okay. And this was done. Syria and Iran are the last two that's left. If we look at Iraq, we look at uh, uh, Afghanistan, we look at all these countries, have you seen how these cities look in comparison to the United States? Yes. They've been bombed back to the Stone Ages. Look how these people live. Yes. Do you know in Iraq that they dropped depleted uranium in Iraq, poison, and over, five, over half a million children were actually... Uh, died from depleted uranium. Okay. The average American people don't know that. No. What what America's foreign policies are? Do you know Jimmy Carter and the gang uh, set up the Mujahideens okay. that were in Afghanistan okay. fighting the Russians? Okay. They were set up back by America. Okay. When you go and find out about ISIS, mm -hmm. ISIS was set up by America. Yeah. That's America's baby or whatever. Mm -hmm. They bash them, they train them, and they give them the money and the military might to overthrow those governments. Those are all puppets of America. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, sister, this is why they're so angry. When you think about 9-11, uh, yes. and they said there was 19 of those so-called terrorists were from Saudi Arabia. Right. Why, why is not Saudi Arabia on the list? Great Why are they not on the list? That's right. They're not. They're not on the list. Yeah. They're not on you the know, list. think about this. America's dollar is backed by the petrol dollar with Saudi Arabia. Okay. America dollar is no longer backed by gold or silver, but it's backed by pet, the petrol dollar, and that's between America and Saudi Arabia. So you know what? So stay right there. There you go. That's where we're getting to. Remember, we always talk about the symptoms versus the issues. So the real truth is, it's America's wanting to dominate and dominance for something in another country. Just like we talked about John Perkins, James Perkins, the Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Excellent. We want Excellent. something that someone has, so we're going to create the narrative. We're going to create the conversation. We're going to create fear, which then justifies our momentum and movement into that place to cause devastation. And But see... Aha, America, you can't do that at home as well. You're doing that at home. So what do you think is going to happen in America? I want us to ask that. Do you actually think? Queen. That, yes, King. Queen. Yes. I love you. I, uh, uh, Queen, you know what's going on. I, Perkins, you, 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 you see what's going on, Queen. Well, Have a blessed day. I love you. Okay, I love you. Have a wonderful day as well. Everyone, I mean, I just want us to really get to the root of things the root causes if you will because uh, we can't keep being shadowed in what is really happening the truths are what is happening thanks for your patience great morning to you good morning good morning i saw um i think the last part of your um video um about muslims and stuff like that mm -hmm. it reminded me of um uh hispanic groups in los angeles in the area out there working with white people to displace black people out of the neighborhoods. Yes. They they use their gangs, they use they use their political clout yes. to move black people out of neighborhoods. And they did this in conjunction with white folks. Okay. Now I just I read yesterday that these Hispanic communities are fighting against white folks because white folks are gentrifying their neighborhoods. Yeah. Bringing up rent $2,500 and stuff like that. Right. You know, the same people that they were working with to displace black people okay. now are displacing them. Yes. That's what white people have done with Arabs. Okay. Arabs are some, first of all, they call themselves white on the census forms. Mm -hmm. They work with white, they have worked with white people to demonize 
and 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 wipe out black people. They done it in Detroit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Detroit when it had um, uh, ownership and operation of uh, most of its party stores and yes. and uh, gas stations. Yes. The U.S. Department of Commerce uh, worked with these Arabs, so-called or whatever they call themselves, to displace black people. Mm. Listen, uh, Colette, my thing is this. I have sympathy for people and their eels all over the place, but my main thrust is the liberation of African people around the world. Yes. Until that is done, I really can't bring out my cavalry for anybody else. I really can't. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They have to hold their own testicles on this. You know it. what I'm saying? Because they uh, have worked very aggressively to demonize and displace black people. Yes. Even like with that clip, I only saw the last part of it. These two brothers up there, they could hardly get a word in because they don't even really like black people. They have been trained from birth to this white people. So I have no overwhelming sympathy okay. for what they're going through because they, in their greed um, to become whatever, mm. are worked against black people. You know what I'm saying? All the stuff that we're going through in our communities, including the so-called inter, inner uh, violence, which is also perpetrated by systems of white supremacy. Yes. yes. Uh, we, we don't have no time for... I don't have no time, and I know a lot of us don't have no time to show all this grief to these folks because they've been, uh, in part, um, uh, with white folks, our enemies. So they have to hold their own testicles. Good luck. If you're really about something, uh, you would um, see what's going on with us and and, and show some remorse, atonement, and uh, admit that you've been our enemy too. They look over in Egypt, for instance, yes. which was uh, uh, originally black. White white people came over there and put these Arabs in there. Now they're calling some all over the place. You know what I'm saying? Again, until African people are liberated, um, I don't know what to say about these other people. All right, I appreciate uh, the call. Thank you so peace. much. I mean, everyone, that's what it's about. I want it to be able to present something to us so we can think about it. We can look at it. We can dissect it. A lot of us can agree to disagree on it, but at the end of the day, we are better because of the conversation. We're going to continue it tomorrow. You know we're going to have Son of Man on the first hour from 7 to 8 a.m. So it's going to be quite interesting to get his take as we continue the conversation. I'm going to have a couple different uh, clips for us as well. But I want us to really look at it. Who is the real terrorist in America? How does that impact you and what you think? Or maybe more so, what is the narrative? Who shapes what you think and believe that you are? And then what you do every day and what you can accomplish and how it impacts your family and your community. Think about it, everyone. It's been an amazing conversation. Our time is up, but we'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m., bright and early, for more coffee and conversation with Colette. Have an amazing day.